like to welcome Ann Cohn to the Haight-Ashbury Oral Video History Project. Uh, welcome, Ann. Oh, welcome. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay. Well, we'd like to learn a little bit about you and uh, and then fit all the pieces into this giant puzzle of the 60s Great. that you're a, a big piece of. Um, where were you born? I was born in Los Angeles area in Glendale. In fact, my uh, dad still lives in the same home I was born and raised in. Wow. Alcazar. What's your father's name? Alan Bunt. So I was Anne Mary Bunt. Wow. Beautiful. And yes. your mother's name? Nettie Virginia. And uh, she is with us or present? No, she's passed away. Yeah. My mom was quite an artist. She was a um, singer, artist, and it's something that's handed down. Grandparents, great grand, all the women wow. were filled with a muse. Wow. What, um, uh, uh, your grandparents, where were they from? Let's see, Germany. We have ger good old German stock, English yes. stock, that's where they are. And I moved up to um, Southern, uh, from Southern California up to San Francisco when I was about 20 years old. Okay. And I had to move away from the home. And what, about approximately what year was this? This was back in 1966. I moved to uh, Walnut Creek when I was a hairdresser. Oh, and, wow. And um, during when the 60s were happening and you guys were growing long hair, I was busy cutting it. No, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> and then my husband um, uh, was killed in an automobile accident oh, in sorry. December 13th of 1969. Wow. So about six months after drive, rushing to get home to start dinner and remembering he was gone, I leased my house out and went hitchhiking around the country. Wow. Before that time, I was pretty conservative Republican. Wow. And but how old were you? 22 when he died. Wow. And he was in a coma for a couple of weeks, and I had to tell him to turn the machines off, and his brain went flat. So that was... Hard. That was a big one. That was hard. So and you were looking for, for some butterflies. You were looking for some... Uh, just life. happiness. Yes. Right. And, and because I had gone right from living at home into marriage, I was didn't know too much about this world. Right. So I was on a quest when I went hitchhiking because I knew that there was good in every single person alive, and I was out to find it. Right. <laughs> what brought you back to San Francisco? Well, first of all, I ran out of money, mm -hmm. and then I got a job uh, managing a beauty salon. But then from then I started uh, went into real estate because I oh I got married. You and met I met somebody else, um, and then I was Ann Peters, and um, I'm getting it mixed up. That's okay. <laughs> I haven't had anybody ask me these questions they, before, Rebecca. I've not been interviewed before. It's all right. Well, I'm glad we're doing this. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I met my children. Because you're quite a joy. Yes. yes. Thank you, Rebecca. You are. Yes. Yeah. I met my children's papa, Steve, uh, Steve Oliphant, and married him. I was... 25, I think, something like that, and I had two children. What are their names? Patrick uh, Oliphant, he's now 29, and my daughter, Christy Oliphant, she's 25. Ah, beautiful. Right, and um, Stephen and I were together about 10 years, 15 years. During that time, I did wigs for a local theater group. I was the head wig girl. And I also headed up a lot of children's art programs for our city of Walnut Creek. I would get two, three, four hundred children together and we'd do art. And I would, I did this for a number of years. Because it was just fun and I really like the muse. I'm my mom's darling. That's right. <laughs> and and then, investing in children is always pays off. Yeah. Yeah, and so then um, Stephen and I did divorce. I don't remember the years. Divorce yes, years, I never remember. Not necessary. No, no, I remember. And when I remember people, I always remember them fondly, no matter what happens. Yeah. Because why not? Why not? It's great that way. And then I met Alan in uh, Alan Cohen in 1986. This and is a photo of Alan. I'm going to, yeah, this is a photo of Alan Cohen. This was taken at Cal Theater for the Jan Kerouac benefit. I love this photo. 
And in, I'm going to show you a photo of Alan and me and Christy at the 20 year anniversary of Summer of Love. Weren't we young? It's a, it's a great photo. Young and beautiful. You're still young and beautiful. I was so at awe. Forever young. I spent most of my life just taking care of my family. You yeah. Know? I never, just wasn't the rock, I wasn't a rock and roll girl. Right. In fact, I never, I don't even have a, you know, I still don't have a, um, a radio in my car. Wow. I like the silence because I find that the silence and the, the city noises is beautiful music. And I always like to live where I am right now. At, at, at this point in your life and even a little earlier, did you find yourself drawing? Uh, I know I just recently found out how artistic you are. I, I, I um, found drawing. In fact, how I found the drawing, um, because before that I did a lot of, I make up, I'm a singer and I compose music, children's music I mostly do, and now I, I make it up on the moment with the children. But I found it was so expensive to record the music that it wasn't a way for me to really get out what I needed to. So I started doing black and white drawing because for six cents, I could uh, reproduce it. And so I didn't have to worry about the recording. So you would see me out at music venues and I'd be sitting here down like this, just drawing. And I, um, I loved it. So I did line, line drawing. Love to see some. Well, Here's a picture of Alan, right over here, and Tony Selden is here, and this would be Jerry Nicosia and George Mikowski. Oh. And we used this for posters. I did a bunch of these. It's amazing. Oh, yeah, that people capture who they yeah. are. Who On they this are. other side, I illustrated, not only did I illustrate Alan's uh, poetry, but I illustrated Tony Selden, the vagabond poet, one of Alan's dearest, dearest friends. Let me show you another picture. Oh, here's another one that we used for um, a benefit. Not a benefit, one of our shows. We did a lot of shows. I would back Alan musically on the stand-up bass or guitar. So, so you play guitar? Yeah, I do. I play on different strings. I have, I play harp, guitar, and um, bass. Wow. Yeah. So basically, you know when you're a wife and um, you have a lot, somebody you love, and they have some area that they need to feel special with Alan because he was so out there. <coughs> he needed, he wanted, when he was in the 60s, he wanted to have artists, and he, with the Oracle, it was all about uh, having um, collaboration of the different muses. Well, he did that in his own life. He liked doing that. He, so he had me play the stand-up bass, and, or the guitar, and in fact, the first time I played the stand-up bass after many years was in front of 20 or 30,000 people at the... Um, at this event for 20, you know, so I was, oh, wow. I didn't play that well, and there was a great sound man, and he <laughs> knew when I was, had great licks, he turned me up, and when I sucked, <laughs> he turned, turned it down, he was great. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, when I met Alan, it just changed my world, because I hadn't really gotten out of my backyard, you know, being a mom of two children, and my children were five and nine when Alan and I met. In fact, here's a family photo. Here we are. It's a great photo. And it was about the time. Alan is here, was growing back. I had cut his hair shorter. <laughs> it's a great shot. Yeah. Yeah, I like that There's picture. There's something to be said about being simple. It just changed my whole world because I hadn't I spoke with the children and I did my you know whatever music I was doing so being out in the world it was a little bit uncomfortable and Alan says no they're gonna love you <laughs> it'll be okay <laughs> and he was such a sweet man yeah he was and I wanted to talk a little bit about Alan's poetry 
But it seemed, I mean, you weren't here in the 60s, but through Alan, who what the 60s was so much part of Alan, uh, you got to relive it in a lot of ways and with the friends and the people in the community. I mean, I can't imagine, I feel I'm part of this community, but I can't imagine you not in the community. And, yeah. and so through Alan, you were able to relive some of the 60s and get the feeling and the essence of it. Well, what I liked about it is that I really didn't know any of you through your fame. I knew you. And right. I really, because I don't really care about That's fame. Right. Exactly. And so, like, right now, after Alan passed, Pat, Alan passed away on um, March 29th last year, one of the, one person that's really helped me a lot is Stephen Levine. And he is an author of many, many books on death and dying, a very spiritual man. And he actually, he was one of the editors of the Oracle back okay. in the 60s. But I've gotten to know these people in, with um, just, just their, and I prefer knowing them personally than with the fame anyway. And it's comfortable. It's real interesting. It's almost a calling. I mean, it, it, Alan's legacy is left in your hands. It certainly is. I call this Alan's baby blanket. When I met Alan, he was living on 26th and Irving. And this had all the different oracles wrapped in, we're all wrapped in this, in this tie-dye from the 60s. <laughs> what was the oracle for people who don't know? Well, it was a visionary newspaper. I brought one. Uh, that was solutions and quests and artists and writers that came together. An oracle staff that... Uh, um, Put the art and use uh, art and um, poetry and writing together in a fashion that it made it beautiful. Solutions that were beautiful. It wasn't complaining about what we don't have. It was looking forward, and so hopefully that people would embrace these values that we felt so strong with, and want them to be all over the world. Exactly. Yeah. Not so, the bad news, but the hopeful yeah, news. Yeah, the good old the oracle. Do you know how often they came out? Well, they were supposed to be coming out every six weeks, but I think it did end up being a little longer than that. You know, Rebecca, you're asking me questions about the oracle. That's when I want to call up the oracle staff and say, Well, we have more Come on! <laughs> Answer those <laughs> questions for me. Well, we will. Because Alan... In our lives, Alan was actually a fairly private man. And when we were at home, I was busy doing my work, he was doing his work, and we were just living life. And I always stepped back when we were in public so he would shine. So I didn't, wasn't trying to take ownership of his, right. his world. Right, right. So and when he passed, I was got a hold of the Oracle staff, wonderful staff, wonderful people, I got to tell you. And I, uh, when I would, we've been emailing, we've been trying to revisit the Oracle again in doing a new uh, publication of a new Oracle. And I've been pre spearheading it, and when I make mistakes, they're so sweet. Yes. They're just they're wonderful people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it's your... It, it's, it's, to me, it's a destiny that you've fallen into. I want to ask you a little about Alan. Okay. Um, from living with Alan, learning, do you know when Alan came to the Haight-Ashbury? Do you know anything about his experiences here? Uh, how he became part of the Oracle or any of these? Yeah, I do. Um, he actually came to North Beach because he's a poet, and he wanted to be part of the Beatnik. But by the time he got here, it had, was already dissolving. And he went to City Lights Bookstore down in the basement and ran into a, a, a high school friend, Steve Walzer. And Steve Walzer was living in the Haight and offered him a place to stay. So that's how he came to, to the Haight. Wow. And he, at the time, shortly after that, he met a woman named Lori. 
and uh, they fell in love. And one night, the Allen had this dream of a newspaper being read all over the world in rainbow colors. And he told Lori about it. She went out on the street and told people about it. And the rest of it is history. Yeah. <coughs> Amazing. Alan had many parts to him that a lot of people don't know. Um, I knew him also and loved him dearly. Um, and he's a writer. Uh, can you tell us anything else about the Alan you know that maybe the world doesn't know? I have to tell you, there was a time <coughs> that Alan was um, editing in a city magazine. And I watched him edit it. Do you know how he edited it? He would cut it apart and not add any words, and he would just put the puzzles back together. He was incredible at this. Layouts. Layouts, the way he would lay them out, and it was excellent. Alan um, was a midwife. When he left the 60s uh, at the Haight-Ashbury, he moved up to a com commune called Table Mountain, and he became a midwife. In fact, he Amazing. wrote this book called Home, uh, Childbirth is Ecstasy. Wow. And he, in this book, he delivered his son, River. I'm going to show you a picture of sure. River. This is, um, the pictures were, it all came about uh, Lori. This is Lori, the woman I told you about. She uh, was just about starting delivery. Alan was going to be the midwife. Steve Walzer, the photographer who lived down in the uh, in San Francisco, happened to be coming up, came up there, and he took these pictures. <coughs> this is Alan, <coughs> and this book, I think they sold like 500, 500 to a thousand copies, but. It was shared, just like the Oracle, um, different midwives would share it because this book is pretty explicit in its color, in the, in the photographs, and the poetry, it was explaining the home birth. So is it really still available? Of, no, no, it's definitely out of print. Yeah, that was quite a book. And um, Alan also was very, like I said, was very serious about his poetry. Here's a picture of Alan reading his poetry. You can see Alan <coughs> right here, right there. And then this is uh, Emmett Grover. OK. And um, I brought this. And then also, I wanted to bring, throughout all Alan's life, he's been writing. Here's a picture of Alan in the basement of City Lights Bookstore reading poetry. And then later on, Alan um, really did a lot of music uh, accompanying with George Mikowski. I think you interviewed George. Yes. Just, in fact, it was great to give him a hug this yes. afternoon. He's contributed a lot. Yes. And That's I think... What is this? Where is this photo? This was taken, I believe, when we did the 25th anniversary of the Summer of Love, and that would have been in the, on the soccer field. Was that when we did right. that? Towards yes. the beach. At the beach, right. right. Over, yes. And um, that was a great show. These always have, these are, these have been great shows. So Alan loves to, in fact, Alan did a, put together an opera with a woman on his poetry. Uh -huh. And uh, the world is a butterfly's wing. Wow. But, Writing was, and his poetry, what I'd say was his big passion, and wanting to start the oracle up again. That was, yes. That, that was something, because that was bringing the muses together to have the burst of energy that makes people stand up and take notice. And then take action. And take action. Yes. Um, would you like to read something of Alan's? Oh, yes, I would. I think what I'm going to do is one of Alan's dearest friends was um, Tony Selden. And um, I'm going to read a poem 
that Alan wrote about the vagabond poet. Um, here he is, back from Baja on his way to Denmark, the fandom vagabond poet. He's welcome everywhere, 72 invitations to stay in Scandinavia, a cabin offered in Mendocino, performing his magic act at this very moment on stage for his last appearance in America. His poems flow around the world. Watch out, melancholy Danes. Here he comes for dinner with his laundry, tossing Caesar salad with his videos, poems, and tales. The vagabond poet leaps across borders and continents. Alan was true to his friends. And he wanted to help people with their muses and things in their life. I can't tell you how many times people have said, if it hadn't have been for Alan Cohen, I would never have done the writing that I've done, or I would never, because he was like a father to a lot of people. Without any reason to do it, other than just the joy of doing it. He didn't have any passion about it. He was very passionate about it. He's a very passionate man. And when he tells you he's going to do something, he would do it. But getting him to uh, commit, that was one of the main reasons why he wouldn't commit unless he knew he was going to do it. Exactly. Very honest. Okay. He worked with me in my school. The children loved him. And um, that was great. That was, um, that was a great experience. He was very lenient with him. At first it would drive me nuts because he'd say, <laughs> Well, why can't they just take their Hot Wheels and drive them down the hill? <laughs> but he just he just was full of life. He kind of, there was a part of him that was very serious, and then there was another part that was very elf-like. Childlike. Too, and childlike, that's right. In fact, um, after the 60s, he, uh, would, he, he, he sold... Uh, Crystals at the Renaissance Fair, and he'd wear this hat. <laughs> or he would sell fruit, saying, come have some papaya, get higher with papaya. <laughs> and uh, he was... See a lovely picture you have there. Is that taken on Haight Street? Yes. This is a picture of Alan on Haight Street. With a friend. Yeah. Jean Anthony did this photograph. It's great. In fact, Jean Anthony and Alan uh, did um, a series of shows over at the Roxy, mm -hmm. slideshows. In fact, it was through that sh uh, series of shows that we ended up getting the publisher that uh, uh, did the facsimile of the Oracle, which is the Oracle in the entire 12 issues right. plus a false start. And it came about from Jean Anthony. That's wonderful. But yeah, Alan was a pretty handsome man. That's, it looks very familiar, the green backpack. Yeah, Alan oh yeah. would wear that all the time. This, <laughs> this backpack? Yeah, Alan would be, because you know Alan never drove. Right, exactly. He's from New York, and so he never drove. If I ever, I asked him to take the wheel for me one time, <laughs> he drove a car like this. <laughs> like, you know, my children helped. helped. Wow. Right. <laughs> when we'd go on trips together with the children, we would start stories, and it would go around from Patrick to Christy to me to Alan, and we'd just make up stories. How about fun? Our lives were really based around creativity. Yeah. And Alan and I made a pact that I would, I would, um, I would uh, work with us. He'd work with me in the school, and he would teach me how to learn how to make money with my artwork. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have some other photos there. Oh, there's a. Uh, uh, um, did I show you? Oh, right. I you know I didn't show you this. Oh, yes, I did. Yeah, we saw that one. Um, and I think we did. I did show you that, that other one. photo of him. These are. This was the um, last book that Alan, book of poetry that Alan and I did. It was the first time we collaborated with uh, the art and the uh, poetry throughout the entire book. 
this was came out in um, October of last year. And when they did the benefit for Alan, so he never saw it completed. We did see it completed. We just never it. really had a good book signing. We didn't oh, get okay. to do that because did that. right. In fact, we were going to have the book signing over there at the um, um, Great American Music Hall, but it ended up being that Alan had his um, uh, liver transplant. Right. Right. This was the That's book. That's great. Book of hats. Book Wear of many hats. hats. <laughs> yep. And um, this was a book when Alan, uh, there was a period of time Alan and I set divorced. And uh, we were divorced for two years. And we, about six months after we divorced, we became close friends again. But while we were divorced, Alan put out this book <coughs> called An Eye for an Eye Makes the Whole World Blind. And this was a collaboration, again, of poets all over the United States that would send in their work. And Alan would, uh, we put, they put it, and he put it in the book. He pulled, published this with Clive Matson. Wow. He really did spend his adult life wanting people to collaborate together. This it's a was, way. It's a way of joining. It's a way of joining. Gathering. Finding the things you agree on. It's it's a very peaceful, positive energy. Yeah. A way to create peace and mm -hmm. communication and understanding. Oh, there, yes, there was a time when Alan was having sleep deprivation and uh, there was a mockingbird that woke us up about two in the morning and it kept waking us up and Alan decided that he was going to see about having the mockingbird stop this. So he <laughs> got up about two in the morning and went and got a flute. Well, he had a flute and the mockingbird started the singing and he played the flute back to the mockingbird. And she did leave. Oh, how wonderful. <laughs> he always had a very peaceful way of dealing with situations. And then you guys remarried? We remarried. Um, when we separated and divorced, I told Alan that if um, he ever got sick, because he had to see, he should come home. And so... Uh, when Alan got sick, he came home. That's love. And we were met. Yes, that's love. So you're telling me I have two minutes, so I'm starting to cry. No. Nope. <laughs> two minutes in a, a lifetime. <laughs> it can. What I would like to say, I want to say thank you so much. And I'm Rebecca Nichols, I'm the moderator. But I would want to say thank you much for being here. I want to ask you a question if this tape is watched in the future. And I see a lot of passion here, a lot of love here. Uh, it's like the, uh, the altar's been handed to you. If for some reason, it's come in your hands and his memories. How would you like Alan's work spotted in the future? How would you like 50 years from now when something of his is picked up and read and when people punch in the libraries, Alan Cohn, his memory, how would you like him, how would you think he would want to be remembered? I think the way the he's been remembered now, and like I had said, he's like a father figure to a lot of people, and he holds the muse near to him, and love, compassion, and harmony, these were very important to him, and they're very important that we look for the good and vision the good, and not worry about the, not think about how uh, things are going wrong. And I think that through the Oracle and through Alan and the other Oracle staff, this is extremely important and we need this more. Ne this year, next year, 50 years from now, peaceful people that laugh when there is uh, an obstacle Laughing will make the barrier go away and there'll be no uh, barrier. And I think that that's... I think when 50 years from now people watch this piece, they will also see the strong woman behind a great man. Yeah. 
could I read a little poem, just a little poem, Deb, just a second. We were talking about, uh, this is a poem I wrote since Alan passed. I wrote this one, Songbird. Songbird rides the waves around her. Her song reflects her surroundings. Oh, sweet bird, let your song be one of easiness, one that joy and good health is plentiful. Let the heavens rejoice with this newfound love in our world. For with jealousy brings a shrill that is destructive to all. Sing your love song for diversity, so all mankind will be in harmony with you. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you, Rebecca. And I hope the future you write many more things that can see or inspired. And we will be we will be in 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 uh, in, in a relationship, I think, woven in the future to document all of this stuff to spread the inspiration and the light and the words and the future generations will benefit from this community that has contributed so much to the whole. Yeah. I want to tell you thank you.